All right, guys, welcome to another episode of Real McCoy Radio. Um, I've got a, a good friend of mine, Chad Hackler, on today. Howdy. Yeah, very excited um, to talk with Chad here with you guys. Um, you know, Chad and I just met each other probably two years ago mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you've been, have offered me advice during some tough times. I kind of came to you in a period of my, of my life when I was trying to find, uh, find North. Um, but yeah, today will be a little um, different, not too different because Chad, you've got uh, a lot of history in the fitness industry. So most of uh, what we've talked about so far on this podcast has been industry related, mm -hmm. uh, you know, business uh, value um, and different ways to be either a better personal trainer or fitness entrepreneur or um, social media influencer or being the uh, the personal trainer that makes it into on the TV or all those different things, um, gym owner. Um, so you definitely have um, some history there, which you're going to tell us about. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to start um, the episode just with a little bit of context and to tell that to me, it's a you know a important story to me. Um, and we kind of crossed paths at the right time, I think. Um, it all it all kind of started. Uh, my wife Tana was shooting at Madoma, mm -hmm. um, which is where you are. You there full time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you spend all your days at Madoma. Yeah, so I run the personal training school there as well as being the director of fitness. And so any any of our patients that are kind of uh, coming to a place where they're functioning well, then we want them to function more well, if you yeah. will. And so that's kind of where the fitness side comes in. Yeah, well, she she was shooting there. You guys let her use the gym to do a shoot for Caged Muscle, her supplement sponsor, and um, she's like, "Greg, you got to come check this gym out. It's really cool." Um, <laughs> and it's kind of a hidden gym in and yeah, of, it, totally. of itself. I'd never heard of it, and I went there, and it was like, you know, I appreciate some good equipment, and I was like, I saw some like eccentric hooks and like stuff that <laughs> only like you know somebody that knows what's going on right. would be like okay somebody equipped this place for real <laughs> well it's funny because like our our original outfit of equipment was was really tremendous uh, you know legend uh, outfitted a lot of that yeah. and kind of a mixture of a few things but you know 30 years of doing this and i've always been on the performance side like athletically you know you're kind of the guru it, it, it's funny when people mention to me hey what do you think about bodybuilding i'm like Greg McCoy, you know, go, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's not my, my ball of wax, yeah, yeah. but uh, vertical jump, you know, speed sprinting, you know, we could talk all day about just kind of the, the evolution of performance. And, uh, you know, Westside Barbell yeah. was really a major influence back in the late 90s. Dave Tate, Louie. Did you uh, watch the documentary? No, which one? Oh, there's a Netflix documentary called Westside vs. the World. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. I'll have to check if that out. If you guys haven't seen Westside vs. the World, it is a must-see if you're into this. That's awesome. It's great, man. It's great. Yeah, the, the treasure trove of information there. You know, there's stuff that will probably forever be lost because there's so much information in that man's head. Yeah. And that really, um, oh, what's his face? Who's the guy in Jersey uh, that trains athletes? DeFranco. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So Jim DeFranco. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he had was trying to find a way to take some of Louis's methods and convert it to more of a um, athletic realm, if you will. And and I thought, you know, what a great idea because I just segmented the two and bringing that together. I mean, Louis is just a beast, but yeah, legend, man. Yeah. So so, anyways, yeah, I, I go into the gym, I see it, and I was like, okay, I need to get to know whoever's you know here, <laughs> um, and. Uh, one of our clients at the time, Rebecca, was working yeah. for you guys doing social media. She introduced us. I came by just for kind of, I didn't really know what I was trying to accomplish other than get to know somebody new. Uh -huh. You know, I like to meet new people in the industry. Um, but well, this was this was right at the time I had sold Destination, I don't know, maybe six, eight months prior. And it was a kind of like a weird time for me because I, you know, had you know, spent nine years, kind of my identity was as a gym owner, and now I wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, I was enjoying a break um, and personal training, but at the same time, I was like, this isn't like kind of enough for me to just do for, for good. I need to like figure, I need a n what's next. Right. Um, so anyways, you know, I, I just kind of, you didn't know me from anything, and I gave you a very brief history <laughs> of what I was doing, and then you just started like, speaking to me on the spot like um you know we we prayed together almost immediately 
And, you know, the things you were saying to me, like, really hit home. And it was some of the best advice I got. I saw, I sought a lot of advice during that time period, and yours was some of the best advice that I got. I'll, I'll tell it here in a second. But you reflect on that, that kind of quick meeting at all? You know, man, that's <laughs> – I, I'm first of all, I'm 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 thankful that it was able to hit home because one of the things that you know through the the difficult times that I went through in my early 30s, I'm going to be 50 in February. Uh, it's kind of crazy to think about, but um, in my early 30s, this the transitions, if you will. I think we, you know, people our age go through transitions and they kind of wonder what's the next thing. And I'm kind of a futurist in my personality anyway. Um, but what I was able to find, I found something that grounded me. And, and I grew up in the church. My father, uh, was he's an elder in the church. My grandfather was a preacher over 50 years. My great-grandfather, like, it, like there's this rich heritage of faith in our family. But I found that there was a difference between religion, um, where there's kind of this doing the rules and as a personal trainer, you know, you can do something long enough that you kind of learn the rules of fitness, the, the rules of putting a you know, chest and try day together. But then there's a time where you go away from the rules for a particular circumstance. And through that time of being in the desert, if you will, uh, it kind of taught me how to trust the Lord and how to listen to his voice. Because so often we're going out there doing things, but we're not listening. Kind of reminds me of Mary of Bethany. You know, she's sitting at the feet of Jesus, and her sister Martha says, Jesus, aren't you going to tell her to help me with all the chores? And Jesus just looks at her and says, Martha, Martha, you're, you're preoccupied with so many things, but Mary has chosen the better thing. And like that really got my attention. What is it about sitting at the feet of Jesus being quiet, listening, and from that place, he really began to just unveil in other people, like, how does the Lord see Greg McCoy? And as you sat in the chair, as we call it, uh, <laughs> as you sat in the chair, it's like I got downloads. And it's not because I have anything special, but it's his presence through me. that It's like he began to show me how he sees you. He sees you as this amazing person. And it's almost like, you know, like the thing in Fantastic Four. It's like I didn't see you with rocks, but I saw you as this man who carried people. And you had carried somebody almost to the goal line and fallen from exhaustion. It's like that's what I saw. I can't explain how I see yeah. it, but that's what – and it's just like I was just sharing what I saw with you. And you were so open and, and um, yeah, it's just the best word. Like I think – it's, it's a testament to your character because not only were you open to it, but you were willing to go do something with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I put it into practice. I mean, just, yeah. I mean, literally like segments that you gave me. I mean, you know, I, I think one of the, the best piece of advice that I got the whole time was, you know, you kind of understood like, look, you, you built this community of people and they love you and they love each other. Um, just because you don't have a business doesn't mean that needs to go away. Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. there's, you know, that that's a great, a vibrant community. Keep loving them and keep providing platforms. And then at least you've got options, right? you know, de depending on whatever you do. And yeah, I mean, I think with like the next week, I like sent you a flyer <laughs> of a, you know, a reunion event we did or a um, gym field trips or these, you know, I did activities, but even this was, I had no knowledge that I would buy the den and turning it into hidden gym. I mean, this is, I didn't even realize that would be an opportunity for another six to eight months. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, kind of on your advice and that line of thinking, I started to do those things. And, you know, it really did. It really helped um, when, it, when it did come time to, to buy the gym and to launch it. You know, I felt still it felt very connected. It wasn't like I had been dark for a year mm -hmm. and then tried to like all of a sudden get it going again. Mm -hmm. So that was one piece of advice. Um, then one thing you just told me this, you know, this one hit me hard too. Like I was kind of telling you that I had the dream of owning a gym since high school. And then I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And you're like, <laughs> uh, you know, God put this in you as a kid. So I don't expect it to go anywhere. <laughs> so you, you kind of just told me like, look, if that, if that's like your dream and your purpose, like it's probably not going to go away. Exactly. FYI. <laughs> exactly. 
Yeah, you know, and of course it's disappointing because you're you're such a target when something has gone awry, when it's gone south, you're a target for the wrong questions. Because at some point you start considering, well, if this is true, is that true as well? And then that's where we become open to other people's criticisms, to their suggestions. And that's been the thing for me. It's like I think that's why prayer becomes so important. Because who hasn't been through hell at some point and had nowhere to go, nowhere to look, and you prayed? Mm -hmm. You know, deep down, if if people don't even consider themselves to be a believer, they prayed because, hey, you know, what can it hurt to throw something out there, (laughs) (laughs) see if it grabs onto the wall, you know? I think this is what people do when they're in trouble. You know, absolutely. I, you, know, you hear that a lot. One, uh, one kind of uh, what would you call it? Parallel, I guess, that you gave me was a you know around the story of Moses spending forty years <laughs> in the desert to get prepared for his mission. I didn't. Luckily, I spent a year in between gyms, not forty. But, right. Um, you did kind of compare what I was going through to that that time. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so, you know, and again, this is one of those things that um, I spent several years, um, and I'm going to indirectly kind of get to your answer, sure. but um, in the time where I was really kind of finding my way out of the desert, if you will, I was looking for something, but I had no idea what I was looking for. And in that time of really just connecting with God, uh, I began to pray something, and I felt like he was helping me to to like formulate that request. But I began to pray, God, the same way you gave wisdom to Solomon, I've always latched on to wanting wisdom. Like I've always prayed for it because the Bible says, ask for it and he'll give it to you. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I like free. Yeah. And so if uh, if you have something free for me, that's the thing I want. Well, he began to give it to me, but as I prayed, I said, God, I want Solomon's wisdom. And the thing is, is you gave him a choice. I love you and cherish you and, and, and want to see you succeed so much. Ask for anything, and it's yours. Man, you know what? If I'm going to rule your people, I want wisdom. And he said, and God said, you know what? Because you've chosen wisely, no pun intended, I'm going to give everything else to you as well. And so in asking for that, part of that, if you're, if you're connecting with people, you're kind of asking God, hey, you know, before I open my mouth towards this person, like, what is it about them that you love? What is it about them that you see them going to accomplish? Because think about Moses. Moses, at the time, he was a baby. Uh, the Pharaoh at that time made a decree all young boys, Hebrew boys, need to be killed and slaughtered. So he ends up, I mean, talk about ironic uh, here was the enemy coming against him as a child, and somehow he finds his way, somehow finds his way into the king. So he is raised as a king in Pharaoh's court. So his young identity was as a prince. That's what he thought of himself. And yet he makes a mistake, and then he's in exile, and so he goes and basically has to be a princely man but lives a humble lifestyle as a shepherd for several years. So it's like he had this duality of, hey, there's this thing I need you to learn, Moses, that you didn't learn in the courts. Yeah. You learned who your father was-ish. You learned who your dad was. You learned that you had access to anything. But now I want you to go be humbled and be content. Well, he so adopts that but that when God comes back in the burning bush and says, I've got a purpose for you, are you ready? Uh, I can't speak very well. I'm not very good with you know talking. Fine, bring your brother Aaron and we'll get this thing accomplished. And so that transition of watching that great man go through humbling circumstances, man, I welcome that. And that's kind of what he was showing me in that moment is that you weren't being humbled. You were being placed in a position where you could allow humility to strengthen you. And, and when I listened to you that day, I, just like now, like, dude, I love Greg McCoy because Greg is a house of humility. I mean, you're such a big du- dude, you know? It's like people can look at you and say, man, that guy lifts. I saw the pictures earlier you posted where, you know, years ago, and <laughs> yeah. I'm like, man, the guy's huge. <laughs> you know, that's why people love you because you're, you're, you're the embodiment of hard work, but you're a good guy. And, man, that's the kind of guy that people want to follow. And so in, in that way, man, it's just like you were meant to do what you're doing. 
how dare you think about turning away from that dream when you were young? Yeah. Anyway, that's yeah. all I got. Man, gives me goosebumps still. So, all right. So that that was kind of, I wanted to just kind of set that context of, of, and tell the story of, you know, where we crossed paths for the first time and, you know, how you kind of solidified yourself as a, a good friend and counselor for me in a pretty short amount of time. Um, but let's talk about your... The what I would call the ESPN highlight version okay. <laughs> of of you in the fitness industry because yes. you've done a lot of work in this industry and done a lot of great things. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, starting off my career, um, I was at, at Texas A and M, and you know we love Oklahoma State. We don't have anything against <laughs> you guys. So, <laughs> uh, I started off my career at A and M as a pre med, but sports med. A uh, guy I had no clue what I wanted, and I really was too immature to really know that I wanted med school. But spent two years there and then decided, I think I want to do something else. So I transferred to Texas Women's University to get enroll in their exercise science program. Well, I didn't know that much about the school, but I knew they had a biomechanics, a PhD program in biomechanics and exercise physiology. And I really fell in love with the school, the smaller classes, and really kind of found myself as a leader. Uh, you know, I was in the minority as a male because back then they only let males in in the undergrad programs if you're in one of the allied health fields like pre-med, dental hygiene, nursing, pre-physical therapy, that kind of thing. Uh, but in that time, I think growing up, I was an athlete, and so I lifted weights because I had to. I was an athlete, mm -hmm. but not because I wanted to. Sure. I found a few friends that we got into bodybuilding together and I found this bodybuilding mentor and he was all about, you know, angles this and eating that. And it was like, oh, this is awesome. I remember the Bulgarian program that I did where I was lifting three times a day, six times a week. Oh, gosh. Burnout city, yeah, obviously. Yeah. But I didn't know that. Sure. I was just, you know, wanting to kill myself. And so for two years, I really just imbibed that, that, that uh, lifestyle, that way of life. Just fitness was everything. But then one of the biomechanics professors, we became good friends, and he started to ask me questions. Well, you know, I, I spit out all these things that I thought I knew, sure. and, and he would say, go in the library and look at this. And I found that most everything I was doing was wrong. And I was so, like, overwhelmed by this, man, if I want to be in the fitness industry, if I want to help people, I have an obligation to give correct information, not fairy tales. And so I began my fitness career really with this heavy dose of, of science and evidence-based practices that, that really shaped me. Well, at that time, he also turned me on to strength conditioning. I kind of just found my niche in training athletes. So I knew bodybuilding wasn't for me. I didn't really have the body for <laughs> it. You know, I, I had pretty limited gene potential. <laughs> but athletes, like I've always sure. loved that. And so um, I began my career I uh, did my internship at Presbyterian Hospital here in Dallas. They, uh, they have an incredible exercise science lab. Uh, it was amazing, but I did my cardiac rehab internship there and then got to participate in a lot of studies. They had hockey treadmills. They had a swim flume. Wow. This was like 1991, you yeah. know, 92, back when that wasn't a cool thing. <laughs> but I was, I was exposed to all this science, and so that really started my career off. I worked at te the Texas Club downtown. I was the fitness manager there. And one night, this kind of helped really change my trajectory. I was into fitness. I, I really loved Club Sports International was our, our managing group, but really loved this high-end fitness. It, it wasn't a chain gym. It was high-end fitness. High-end as in high performance? Like country or, club. Okay. Like, you know, the member is the most important part okay. of your service offering. Yeah. We're not just a gym trying to survive. Like, it's all about the member. And I thought that was normal because that's the way Presbyterian Hospital gotcha. kind of looked at it, too. And so uh, one night, uh, I'm roaming around. I was the manager on duty, and, I, and I'm roaming around. Next thing you know, I see these heads walk in, and then I see this head above theirs. In walks Michael Jordan. Wow. And back then, uh, they were, the Mavericks were playing at Reunion, and we were their official gym. Okay. So anytime visiting NBA teams would come in, they would use our gym. We had a basketball gym. It was a really nice club. Well, he comes walking in, and, and, and I'm like, oh, my goodness. Like, I— this is my opportunity to meet Michael. Yeah. And he walks in, and then his trainer, Tim Grover, walks uh -huh. in. And I'm like, oh, wow, Tim Grover, the Tim Grover. You, like, passed Michael. This is yeah, changed. it's it's <laughs> like, you know, I'm going to watch the man show me his greatest stuff. Yeah. And what I watched was one of the most boring workouts I've ever seen. And I had this epiphany 
you know, if that were me, if I had this opportunity, I would be flash and dash and crazy yeah. tools and technology. And it began this quest to really figure out what is out there and how can I set myself apart in the industry. And so when I went to the, the Ranch Health Club in 1997, it was billed as that. We were right next door to the Cowboys back then, but it was this opportunity to train elite athletes and really kind of make my name. Yeah. And that's where I learned the art of toys, technology, and, and how does that set you apart from any other trainer? And so that was the, kind of the first two thirds of my career coming to Gold's Gym. Um, I got to see what the other half looks like. You know, here's a worldwide famous gym environment where they're they're known as something. What years were you at Gold's? So this began 2005 through about uh, 2015-ish. Yeah. And so at that a time, lots going on in the industry at, at that time. A lot changed. During, yes. the, during those ten years. Well, you, you know, one of the things that you saw is you see this kind of circular. You're not seeing the evolution. And I think that's why you have such a unique stamp to put on the fitness industry in terms of innovation. Because what happens? Everybody's trying to maintain a large gym environment, and there are these models where, hey, we know how to be somewhat profitable. We can run a gym. We can run several of them. But where is the industry going? Nobody's talking about that. And so what I began to see is, okay, you know, leadership's kind of been, for me, the thing that, that is my purpose. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, Jerry Maguire style, I put this 21-page email, sent it to the COO <laughs> of Gold's Gym. And I said, hey, man, this is how I think Gold's could evolve and blah, blah, blah. And at the time, the brand new COO was like, oh, Chad, this looks fantastic. But man, I got a job to do. I got to run the gym. Who's got time to dream? Yeah. You know, and I, I totally understood, but sure. that's when I knew my time at Gold's was done. Yeah. And at that point now, it's really this launching pad. So I'd already been running our personal training school, the National Personal Training Institute. It's the largest vocational school for personal trainers in the nation. And it's not necessarily saying much because nobody else is doing that. Okay. You can get in the industry easily. All you need is a, a cert. Sure. And so if you work out a lot and get your cert, you're in. Yeah. But then you have no one trying to pour into you, to invest in you and develop you. And so a lot of trainers get in the industry and then they flop. There, there's no one trying to mentor them. And so that's really what our school is able to do. We spend six months walking people through the process of what does culture look like? What's toxic culture? What is a thriving culture? If you're going to go into the industry, don't just be another follower. We want to create leaders and then send them out, much like Jesus in the Great Commission when he said, um, uh, go and make disciples of the nations. To teach them to do what? Well, to find whatever gold is inside of their little personal mind and work through all the hard work of getting rid of the rock to find the gold. And so that's kind of what our school does is we're looking to help fitness professionals kind of find what their strengths are as an entrepreneur. And so if we can help you develop a social media stamp, uh, if you want to go in a gym, hey, this is how you separate yourself. Are you going to do lectures in the gym or are you just going to show up every day? Yeah. You know, like how are you pouring into the members? And so what was instilled in me in my early days it's all about the member. So how many uh, how many trainers do you put through this school? Uh, at any in given a year. Okay, so in any our I would say our average semester we have smaller classes. Uh, it can be anywhere from maybe three or four mm -hmm. in a semester up to twenty in a semester at one time. Um, I prefer the smaller classes because it allows us to really do a lot more personal coaching. Is that two semesters a year? Two semesters. So, so 12 weeks each. Yeah, so. We split up anatomy, upper and lower body. They learn their origins and insertions each week. It's a different muscle group. We, we focus on muscle groups. Because I think what's happened in the fitness industry, the cart and the horse got, re got rearranged. You see people learning how to do fitness by memorizing exercises that coincide with the muscle group. And Arnold kind of popularized, and not Arnold, way before Arnold probably, but he was such a fun figure for fitness. It's like, how could you not love the guy? I yeah, mean, he's still yeah. hilarious. Yeah. But when you, when you, when you see the, the bodybuilding approach was always working from the outside in, body part training, and then, hey, work your abs. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the NASM model, which I'm not, you know, the greatest fan of NASM, 
but it has its place in the industry. And so they start from the inside out. They start with the spine and work from there. Well, somewhere in the middle, I think, is a happy medium. You know, how do you appreciate CrossFit for what CrossFit is? How do you appreciate yoga for what yoga is? But realize if you can educate people to put the pieces in its proper place, then the member gets the be best experience. Because let's say if you're, if I'm an ex-athlete and you're a, a, a bodybuilder and then, you know, grandpa walks in and wants to get a workout. Yeah. Well, I'm going to superimpose my experience sure. on him. So I'm going to have him get on an agility ladder for no reason at all, but have him do it because that's what I'm. And I'll make him do four sets of 10 on curls. Yes. <laughs> yes. And, you know, yeah. in the squat rack, right? Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah, that, yeah. that no, no. <laughs> and so we're going to take that. And so what I want to do is I want to remove that personal bias and I want to put the member front and center. And so if we can develop protocols for what does a person who's deconditioned need now superimpose your preferences on top of what's best. Yeah. You know, no, uh, no doctor is built on experience. They have to go to med school and then they have to practice within the confines of protocols to help others, but you go there to get results. And so how many trainers offer to, Offer a guarantee, hey, if you train with me for four months and don't lose this much weight, you get your money back. Very few trainers would even dream about doing that, but they should have that guarantee. Yeah. That's why people like you and people come for transformation. They want to see somebody who's been there, done that, who has a track record with that. You know, so that's why I, like, I think our industry is notorious for pulling the wool over people's eyes. We're saying we can provide a service and consumers come to the gym expecting that everyone's an expert, but the industry won't challenge itself. It won't evolve. And so now you see why I'm so passionate about this. Like the next generation fitness professional should want to evolve and want to do what's best for the member. Oh, end of soapbox. No, that's awesome though. I'm on a panel next week at Club Industry Show on the future of personal training. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so taking notes. <laughs> I'll credit you. Dude, you're going to write anyways. everything. It's, it's going to be, yeah, set in stone. No, but, but I think that's great. And um, I'm a big advocate for personal trainers and am a personal trainer myself, um, you know, despite a lot to do owning the gym, but I still train clients 20 hours a week on the floor mm -hmm. um, because I think it's an important job. And I think the more... Um, you know, kind of, I guess you could just call it mainstream opinion, realizes that we're preventative maintenance for most of <laughs> a lot of the preventative healthcare problems. Right. Exactly. You know, we can solve a lot of these problems that we're paying millions of dollars for mm -hmm. um, just by helping people learn to exercise and eat right and just do some basic healthy stuff. I think the role of a trainer uh, is only going to get more important as time goes oh, on. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, at some point when you look at the trend, the obesity trends, the thing about obesity that distinguishes that word is the presence of disease. Mm -hmm. Disease is beginning in the body. And so the more sick, if you will, that somebody is, the more they need some kind of education to deal with that. So if a person is pre-diabetic, well, you know, you can't just throw a predetermined diet at yeah. them. Now, we're in the state of Texas, which pretty much you can do what you want unless somebody has disease. But I think that puts that obligation for the fitness professional to want to be more educated. But, and, but it's it's a bit scary when you think a lot of people being paid to give this advice got a $100 online cert and like to work out. Yes. That's scary. Yes. So, I, you know, I'm a big uh, advocate for personal training education and continuing education and um, what you're doing, I think is just absolutely awesome that they can spend six months really getting set, set up right. Yes. Um, and they're going to be effective, you know, probably for their whole career with that kind of start. So mm -hmm. that's awesome. Um, yeah. So I have some questions here for you because I really wanted um, to, to get into, you know, uh, our faith or the Christian faith in the fitness industry. Um, so I have, these are broad questions because I know uh, I didn't want to put you in a box. I want to let you go a little bit. Um, so as a Christian, why is fitness important to you? Well, you know, first of all, when we look at our, our design, um, for, for thousands of years, there's been this idea that we're not just uh, rocks with life. You know, we like there's something to our creative design. And so if we are body tripartite or three persons, if we are body, mind and some would say soul, some would say spirit, 
Um, at what point do we nurture all three? Because you, you see a lot of pastors who are really overweight and unhealthy and working their tail off, and next thing you know, they're sick. And so they go find a trainer. They go find a doctor that says, you better make some changes or else. And so there's this disjointed part of their life. So as a Christian, why is fitness important? Well, the thing about our, our body, um, it's not vanity. It's about at some point, one of the current themes that you see, and it's not current, it's been there forever, but one of the undergirding themes in the Bible is this idea of stewardship. Every person, Scott, uh, Greg, Tana, you know, every person has been given a distinguishable set of gifts. And so if that's what you've been handed, it becomes our obligation to multiply those things, as we see in the parable of the Ten Talents. Uh, one was given five, one was given two, and one was given only one. Well, the one who was given five and two, they both doubled, multiplied their giftings. But the one who didn't just went and stuck it you know, in a box and kept it safe because he knew that his boss was a hard man, as he said. And so when the master comes back and finds that the one who had only been given a small portion had done nothing with that small portion, he was called wicked. And so there's a degree to which if we are to take care of our bodies, it's not just so we can say, hey, you know, First uh, Corinthians 6 talks about your body as a, a temple. Well, you know, that's a nice theme verse, but it's more than that. At some point, if your health starts to deteriorate to such an extent, you become preoccupied. So if you're preoccupied with yourself, you have very little ability to look at others and helping others. And that's part of what Christians are called to do is we're to love the world. Not go judge the world, but to love the world, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the church, the religious side of what we do sometimes has caused us to focus on correcting yeah. the world. And but, setting rules upon them. As though the rules yeah. were where the life was. Yeah. And I think, you know, poor God, here he is. He's like, hey, you know, I gave you rules to, to create boundaries for you so you wouldn't ruin yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and what did we choose? Yeah. And, and I think in that regard, that's why I really feel like I feel like the goal of the church should be about helping people find their purpose. There's even this four-step model that, that uh, is kind of a part of our mission statement, but uh, part of that is find God, find Jesus, find the Holy Spirit, like know them, and not just know about them, but know them. Find freedom, step two. Three, find your purpose after you've found freedom. And then four, make a difference. And so the thing is, if, if our bodies are in terrible shape, if we're not healthy, we can't find freedom. What we find is a jail cell. We find our own prison. And next thing you know, even little things like unforgiveness. You know, here's the, the current uh, story that's, you know, all the rage right now. Everybody's talking about uh, Botham Jean. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, for our listeners that might not be familiar uh, this this female police officer walked into the wrong apartment thinking it was hers, and she shot this man thinking that he had invaded her apartment. Well, thankfully, his family were, were strong believers, strong Christians. And his younger brother on the witness stand said, I forgive you. You have taken something from us that will never be replaceable. But we forgive you. And what a powerful testimony. I even uh, talked about it on our Madoma website. You know, I don't care about the politics uh, of it all, but what I care is that he demonstrated mercy, that family demonstrated mercy where mercy was not deserved. And so in that regard, when, when I think about what we're trying to do is we should be all about preserving what we've been given making ourselves healthy not that we have to go crazy with sure. fitness but being healthy so that we can serve others so that we can love others i can't love somebody when i'm so busy looking in the mirror at what's wrong with me oh sure. i don't look this way or, or feeling bad or having low energy and yes. all of the trappings of 
of un- unhealthiness and obesity. Exactly. I mean, there, there's a lot that prevents you from living a productive life. I, I think you go backwards on the, uh, what is it? Maslow's pyramid. Uh, mm-hmm. you Hierarchy. Know? Yeah. I yes. think you go down, you know, because you, you're seeking safety and shelter because your body's falling apart. How can you have, how can you be, you know, achieving self-actualization yes. if you don't even know if you're going to live to next year? That's an exaggeration. But, well, and how can you your body s- fall apart and your mind and emotions not fall apart yeah. with it? Yeah. So oh, great answer, by the way. That was really good. Um, <laughs> yeah, but no, it's cool. Um, I think that's a really... Uh, really what I was hoping to hear. And um, that was great. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, so here's a, here's an interesting question. Um, I, I never quite know how to balance this myself. And I can imagine um, you talk about this with your students and you run into this yourself. So as a fitness professional that is a Christian, how do you balance like when it's appropriate to talk about spirituality and when it's not? Is there's, you know, there can be, it can make people uncomfortable. Sure. Um, when, when can you open up about that to maybe a client or a colleague? And when do you feel like it might be crossing the line? I don't know if you have got Sure, it. sure. No, great question. And uh, I think there are a couple of facets to, to look at. Uh, when I was at Gold's, uh, Uptown Gold's, um, when that, when Gold's became corporate, mm-hmm. And uh, that location in Dallas, it was the first Gold's in the Metroplex, reopening as a corporate. Was it a franchise location yes. before? Okay. Yes. I think, and I think it was 24-hour fitness in Uptown before it became gotcha. a Gold's. Uh, but we had a whole group of trainers. It was such a fun time. But that was when I was kind of going through my spiritual awakening, if you mm-hmm. will. And, man, the, the Lord was so good. But it's like he would give me downloads for complete strangers uh, I had all kinds of clients and it's like we would sit down for our initial consultation because every member got a free, sure. you know, yeah. workout, how that goes. Uh, we would have a consultation and all of a sudden, like I would, I would be tearful and the Holy Spirit would tell me something about the person. And so I would just say it. And so the whole like conversation of, well, is it appropriate to bring up? I didn't care. I was going for it. This yeah. might be one, my one <laughs> opportunity to love this person in a way they'd never been loved before. And so I would say something, hey, you know what? This might seem kind of weird to you, but I get the impression that blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden, these these people would break down in tears like, how did you know that? Yeah. I'm like, it would be a fact about their life. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, I, I didn't want to just break out and say, well, actually, I've been practicing to hear the voice of God. You know, I've never heard a tangible word from God, yeah. you know, just to get that out there. Um, I think he can do whatever he wants. But what he did in that time is he was teaching me how to listen, how to be the Mary of Bethany, how to l- sit at his feet and just worship and just position myself so he could help me do my purpose. Mm-hmm. I mean, kind of like I, I shared with you, hey, God's waiting to help you in your purpose. So don't, uh, in, in uh, uh, oh, Joshua, in chapter one, um, basically Moses is handing the, the mantle to Joshua, his next in line, to continue leading the people to the promised land. And he kept saying over and over, be courageous, do not be afraid. My presence is going with you. You know, I've already done it. Yeah. And I think in that regard, like if you knew God's already done the thing in front of you, you're asking him to do like you walk with a little strut, sure. little pep in your step. Sure. And that's what was beginning to happen in that time. And it was so humbling because I didn't know I'm not a fortune teller. I didn't know these things in my flesh, but my spirit man was learning to just listen and then love on people in that time. So in that regard, it was like there was no sense of is it appropriate? Is it appropriate to help somebody? Because a lot of trainers sure don't hesitate to share that they got drunk yeah. last night. <laughs> yeah, Man, we did yeah. this. Like you know the relationship. We're like fitness bartenders. Yeah, yeah. We hear our clients so, stuff. So maybe you're saying in a world where a lot of what we talk about is inappropriate, you, you might as well cross the line by talking about your yes. faith um, yes. versus – your late night activity. Exactly. <laughs> and in one sense, I would say that. Yeah. In the other sense, I would say, you know, if somebody was devout uh, Muslim, uh, devout anything, 
you know, I'm not trying to sword fight and mm-hmm. say my religion is better than yours. Yeah. I, I'm not interested in saying that. What I'm interested in saying is, hey, regardless of your background, God loves you and God wants to communicate through me how much he loves you. And if I can do that in a discerning way, I don't need to throw religion at you. And I think that's what you're seeing. And, you know, I, I heard a stat and I was listening to Michael Miller, the upper room the other day and, and in his sermon, he was sharing sobering facts about uh, every year millions of people are leaving the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. And I was so overwhelmed by that stat. And I think there's a pruning that's occurring to the body of Christ across the world. I think what's happening is that where religion has held the name of Jesus back, I think God wants to reposition the world so the world needs his voice. But when he shows up, he's showing up in love. It doesn't mean he's not, you know, doing hard things, saying hard things, but he's showing up to the world as the answer that he was always supposed to be. Anyway, sorry, I got off yeah, track a little bit, right. but. No, I think that's uh, it's a good answer. And just, you know, there's really not a great answer. I mean, you kind of have to balance it. Right. And I guess, and part of what you're saying is, you know, sometimes a lot of what's going on is inappropriate. So yes, and maybe well, not get too worried. Yes, and and when you think about evangelizing, like I think the church knows that, that word is supposed to be important, but I think instead of like trying to share, hey, Greg, do you know? Like I don't want to use a cliche. Do you know Jesus? Yeah. Well, even if he did or didn't, like. What's next? That sounds like you just knocked on my door with a pamphlet. Yes. And there's <laughs> nothing about nobody's that. Nobody's excited about that. Right. And people counter. have heard that before, and it's a turnoff. <laughs> yeah. But if I said, you know, hey, Greg, um, you know, I've got, a, I've got a scripture that I want to share with you that I think pertains to your situation. Uh, be anxious in nothing, mm-hmm. but by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, bring your request before God. So if you're struggling with the thing right now, offer a prayer. But you know what? Allow some joy to come in. I'm not experiencing joy right now. Well, you know, joy is your birthright because that comes from the Father, and he loves you so much. He wants joy to be a part of your life. And so maybe it's because you're not being thankful. I think that's an important part of that verse because then right after that, he says, and the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds. Like there's a peace that is given to us that quiets our surroundings. And so... Yeah, you're telling me not to be anxious. Well, why should I listen to you? Yeah. Well, because you're positioning yourself to experience the supernatural part of God. That What a weird word. Like, you know, we're scared of that word supernatural. But I think believers are supposed to be supernatural. We're supposed to mimic the one we're made in the image of. And if he's able to change the environment around us, if he's able to take that cloudy water and make it clear and say, hey, Grego, a gym's coming, bro. And this is going to be even better than it was before because now I'm removing the low ceiling and I'm going to make it a cathedral for you. I'm going to have you do what you do best, but I'm going to position you to go more places now. You know, we can't see that at first when we're in our situation. And that's where the stress of of, uh, life causes us to not believe that anybody wants to help. And so we're just a prayer away from opening that door up. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, great, great, <laughs> great stuff. So this um, this is an interesting question and something that I've been kind of reading about lately. Um, I don't know if um, if you've kind of got delved into this or not, but um, you know, a pretty popular statement nowadays is "grind," is you got to get up and grind, baby. Yes. Um, and I've read a few different authors' take on this, but um, a Kind of a counter uh, culture statement to that is that as a, as a Christian, you know, of course, like the Bible talks about hard work being important. Sure. Like it's it's very clear that you know we're we're supposed to work hard. That's kind of part of how we're programmed. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, we're also programmed to rest. And this kind of no sleep, work till you're dead, grinding mentality isn't necessarily the behavior of someone that's trusting God. Like you have to. It's sometimes you have to stop grinding and trust that God's going to do what he says he's going to do. Yes. What's your take on this kind of grind versus faith uh, Man, that's, that's debate? Man, that's a <laughs> hot question, bro. Yeah. Uh, and there's some great answers there, but that's a hot question. And, uh, you know, one of the beautiful things about 
Uh, you know, people are familiar with the term Old Testament, but as far as I'm concerned, that was Jesus' New Testament. Mm -hmm. You know, that's all he had, and it was amazing. And so when I, when I, when I went back and started really focusing on what I read in the Old Testament, that's what I saw is these people were grinding they six days a week, and they would have done it a seventh. I mean, if you think about it, a lot of good friends that I have that are Jewish, man, they're productive. They get <laughs> stuff done. You know, chutzpah is is that word for, you know, that brash kind of, I don't care if I step on your toes, I'm going to get this done. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's zeal. I love it. <laughs> and I think we could learn a lot from that mentality. Um, we go back all the way to Genesis, and we see that on the seventh day, God rested. Was he tired? I don't think so. No way. He was not tired. <laughs> But what's an interesting take, because if you go into Hebrews, the latter part of chapter 3 and then Hebrews 4, uh, the writer of Hebrews specifically is talking about rest. And there's a thing, like when you look, because even this morning I was doing a, a Bible study and I was looking at the very word of rest, because like Shabbat, Sabbath, like it was a holy day. Like there were no other days that were supposed to be, that was a holy day, so there's something about distinction. And to this audience that's listening, like if anyone knows how to be set apart, it's bodybuilders competing. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. when everyone else is eating like doo-doo, you know, they're going to be the ones at the party that's like got this plate with portions over here. And they're just It's kinda... cold too. We don't heat it up. <laughs> <laughs> like that's a compounded problem there. There's nothing sexy about that time. Yeah. But you consecrate yourself for that purpose. And so in much the same way, grind, grind, grind. But on that seventh day, it is a day not to not do nothing. It's not a day. Is that right? Yeah. I got to yeah, check my right. grammar there. You know, at some point, at some point, you set aside a day where the goal is not to, okay, I'm not, I'm not grinding. I'm not grinding because you're still thinking about grinding. Sure. At that point, you say, okay. It's not a day to plan your grinding for the next day. Right. right. <laughs> it's supposed to be a day that says, okay, what's the thing that drives your grinding? That seventh day should be set apart to redirect your energy towards what's going to fuel you for the next six days. Mm -hmm. And so for the, for the Jews, that seventh day meant it's a day of focusing on God. Well, as you and I both know, when you, when you try, you know, Scott, uh, when he was talking about uh, kind of those side gigs sometimes like rejuvenate you. Yeah. I think there's an element of that that when there's overflow, you know, if, if like for my kids, if, if I make a big bowl of uh, <laughs> you know, rice and then I've got uh, one of my little desserts I like to make is, uh, oh, what's a little cream of wheat? I like to do that, put some blueberries on it and then mix about uh, maybe a, a portion or two of protein powder into the the to the uh, cream of wheat, and so when I do that, if I make a big bowl of it, the kids are like, "I want some." Well, if I've made a lot, I have overflow to give to them, and I'm not going to have to be stingy about it. <laughs> but if I made a small amount and they eat it all, I'm like, "Man, where's yeah. mine?" Yeah. Working out of your overflow is the absolute secret weapon to grinding. When you grind and grind and grind and grind, and you don't refill yourself. There's something that feeds into you. And sometimes when you're removed from the world, if people are the thing that bring lifeblood to you, well, if you're struggling with depression, if you're struggling with anxiety, if you're struggling with something that's pulling you down, what's the opposite of that? And how do you get more of that on that seventh day? And one of the things that's really unique about Hebrews 4 is that it talks about the creation story. But what it says is that on the seventh day he rested. Well, if you remember, he kept saying it is good when he would create something, especially when he said, man, like, boom, man, there you are. Oh, that's good. That's good. It was complete. And so one of the beautiful things about um, being a Christian and loving Jesus is that what Jesus did on the cross, he completed something. We don't have to keep working at it to be faithful. It's like, that's what's beautiful about grace. Because he completed that thing, we don't have to strive 
to be legalistic, to follow the law. Like we can experience his grace and his love. And when we can appreciate that, Paul said in Romans, he said, what shall I say then? Shall I go on sinning so that I can get more grace? The more I sin, the more forgiveness I get? Mm -hmm. Well, no, because you forgot that old man was supposed to have died. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, uh, you are a new creation. The old has gone. Behold, the new has come. Well, that's the thing about our fitness industry. What you value, what you behold is what you become like. And so if you follow a bodybuilder who does all these things and come to find out he's not a nice person or he's doing all these things that's disrespectful, you're like, oh, I don't like the guy anymore. And it can be let down. I've had students who had a fitness hero and then come to find out that fitness hero you know, wasn't all that or something happened, whatever. Yeah. Same thing in the church. Like when a pastor falls, when he commits a sin, it's not like pastors don't sin. They're just like any of us. But grace is what makes what we do, what we appreciate, so wonderful. So God completed something. We, we are his creation, and he called us good. So if we can really find that the six days a week that we're pressing in, that we're you know sharpening the saw, as Stephen Covey would say, mm -hmm. go for it. But on that seventh day, fill yourself. And as a practical example, so for instance, if— you're struggling with frustration. One of the things I like to do is I like to go look up verses that have to do with frustration, and then I ask myself, what's the opposite of that? If the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, if at any time that's not emanating from me, because I don't produce that, but the Holy Spirit in me does— if I'm not producing that fruit, but instead I'm getting angry, okay, what's happening? You know what? Joy is the opposite of anger. And so I find all these verses about joy, and then I begin to behold those verses. I look at those verses. I meditate on those verses. You know, for a bodybuilder, you know, you achieve a thing, but then people start wanting you to help them do the same thing. And so you're trying to teach people, hey, you know what? What are you beholding? Are you beholding fast food? If you're working all day and sitting on your butt at work, and then you go to the vending machine and you grab something, what are you be you're not beholding anything, and that's the problem. If you want to be like me, you've got to learn to focus on goals. So start with a habits-based approach where you do these short-term things successfully. Develop an identity of success, and when you're in a regular habit of doing small thing after small thing, you not only feel good about yourself, but voila, now the weight is starting to come off. But too often, a bodybuilder or any kind of personal trainer will say, here's your change, here's your recipe for change, but they didn't do anything to change their identity. They gave them the action without the identity change. And you see these people get on The Biggest Loser and have a structured environment that makes them lose weight, and then they lose that, their identity never changed. Their actions did. So you try to do them apart from each other, a person will return. As you know, we see in the Bible when Jesus says, uh, a spirit leaves a place that goes through dry and arid places and returns with seven spirits you know, more powerful. Well, that's addiction. That's what a stronghold is. So anyway, I'm, I'm really just kind of speaking to the people yeah. who are listening to our story that maybe are like, hey, dude, I didn't know I was going to get all this. Like, I just want to know more about. But that's a good segue into my last question, which was if you compare living a Christian life to an exercise regimen or a diet, like how, how do you recommend people that are busy stay on track? Like, I mean, it's the same thing that I talk about with my clients every day is how to find how to make time to stay fit mm -hmm. or how to make diet a healthy diet habits. Um, it's got to be the same thing for, you know, I know for me, like to, to maintain like my Christian diet is, is reading a bit in the morning. Yes. Um, so, I love your posts when you're showing the books that you're <laughs> yeah, reading yeah, and yeah, yeah it was awesome. What, what do you, you know, you, you obviously talk to people more about, you know, their, life of faithfulness? What do you recommend? What are those kind of habits that somebody could get into? Yeah, so one of the things uh, that in our MPTI course, one of the things we talk about is the difference between outcome goals and process goals. Mm -hmm. And the outcome is what everybody says 
December 31st. Sure, My sure. outcome is I want to lose 20 pounds. I want to have more energy. I want to do this thing. The thing, the problem is, is that your plan to achieve that thing is probably going to fail because you're in love with the idea of change, but you're not in love with the idea of the steps that it takes to That's get the there. That's the part that nobody likes. Nobody like. I don't like it, you know? <laughs> And, and I think with that, that's why I think fitness professionals in next generation need to come and figure out, okay, where are you? The easiest example we talk about in class is, is being a, a human GPS. Mm -hmm. A GPS needs to know one thing. Where are you right now? Every trainer in the world should start with an assessment. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, you know, the, the number of trainers I've, I've seen that, oh, first time, let's go work out. Like, Whoa, wait a minute. You don't know anything about that person's hips, knees, shoulder, rotator cuff. Sure. And that's a little presumptuous. Mm -hmm. And so if I can assess where somebody is currently, and then together we, we say, what are your goals? Okay, great goals. I love your goals. This is how I'm going to help you get there. Well, GPS, it assumes that... It's online and it can access, you know, the data, like, where am I right now? But you punch in where you want to go, and then the app produces the route or the path. That's what we do as and trainers. And timeline. Yes, and with traffic. Like, what obstacles are you going to see? Yeah, this will take two hours with traffic. Exactly, and I think a well-seasoned Or 30 trainer, minutes if you don't, you know, if it's clear. 60 if you're in Dallas, yeah. you know. <laughs> Especially, you know, 75, yeah. that's oh, that's God. our nemesis. Um but but in that regard, I think when you look at when you look at being successful, it's got to start in building your client's identity, like encouraging them. You encourage them by giving them. You know, it's funny because uh, the world has kind of wrapped itself around smart goals, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, timely. You know what? The guy that created that created that for a presentation. He never meant it, meant it to be this scientific thing. But it latched on because nobody else was there. There's an amazing book called Hard Goals. I think it's Mike Murphy or Mark Murphy. Um, but he talks about the thing is it's got to cost you something for it to really make a difference. And so when you think about, well, there's nothing. I mean, you think about attainable, realistic. Dude, look at what you've done in your career. Is that realistic? No, it cost you something and you gave it your all and look what happened. And so if we can create that type of mentality, hey, we're all about what your, your vision that you're creating. The Bible also says where there is no vision, the people perish. You got to have something in front of you, but you need support. Uh, Proverbs 16, 9, I think uh, it says, uh, in his heart, a man plots his course, but the Lord determines his steps. And that's what listening does, resting does. It allows you the opportunity to wait and discern so what are so what are those daily or weekly habits of a, of someone that's wants to, you know, be be a good Christian or to live a life of faith? Like, like if I'm going to tell someone for exercise, it's like, look, you should do resistance training minimum three days a week and probably get in ninety minutes of cardio over seven days. Like, what is that for? Right. The is it read the Bible daily? Is it pray daily? Is it what are those like? those kind of routine habits. I guess that was, that's yeah, kind of no, what good, I'm... good question. And th you know, I started to go off on a tangent that's all here. Good. Thanks for redirecting. <laughs> um, one thing that, that I would say is that you, know, one thing that research showed us in the fitness industry is that there was an inequality between somebody that did a chunk of cardio for 30 minutes and somebody who did 10 minutes, 10 minutes and 10 minutes. So there are seasons where you're working eight, 80 hours, yeah. 60 hours. In those seasons, it's more important to be consistent than necessarily devote a lot of time. So in those seasons, if I have 10 minutes, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to remember what book it is, but the scripture that says um, pray without ceasing. Like there's an aspect of even if it's 30 seconds, if I can have 30 seconds of interaction with God and then go another 30 seconds at lunch, and then go. If that's all I ever do, at some point that's going to wane. But if, my, if I'm being mindful is a popular term in the, in the psychology world right now and has been for uh, the last decade. But when we look at mindfulness, it's the degree to which I am actively engaged in what matters. And when we're not 
enjoying that seventh day when we're not getting our rest. That's exactly what happens. We'll lose sight of what's important. But for the busy professional, biggest things are small chunks. You know, if I can lift for 15, 20 minutes in the morning and maybe another 15, 30 minutes, 20 minutes in the evening, whether it's push-ups in my hotel room, you know, anything that I can do like that, that can't be the backbone. Those are obviously the small choices I make when I'm in my bus- busier seasons. But when I have time, sure, then I reground myself in the foundational stuff three times a week for 45 to 60 minutes. I get that trainer because the trainer allows you to, to get m- better use of your time with what little time you have. And honestly, for the, for, you know, I'm preaching to the choir with the crowd that's listening to this, but um, it's really crucial that those small chunks keep you moving forward. As I like to say in my class, if you're not growing, you're slowing. Uh, pick the two. And you grow by, by not losing ground. Yeah, Hebrew says, let us not shrink back. We can't shrink back as fitness professionals. We can't shrink back in coaching people nutrition. Hey, you had a slip up? No worries. Because we're all about habits. And as long as your habits aren't getting thrown out the window and your new habit is to cheat every day. But I, th- I think that's like, uh, you know, it's really parallel to what I tell my clients on fitness. And um, honestly, it's like feels a little bit relieving as I'm listening to what you're saying. Um, because I'm in one of those busy seasons. I mean, I have a new business that's six months old. I don't have a, you know, when I was taking a break, maybe I'd spend an hour and a half reading a devotional in the morning. Right. Now, like, you know, 15 minutes and I'm probably finished my coffee and on the computer, you know, like, but it's the same thing, like with what we tell our clients in fitness is that, you know, the consistency is really what's going to make your long-term results, not these heroic efforts. If you went to the gym for a three-hour session, but that's all you did within two weeks, right? You ju- you didn't do anything except get tired and probably sore. Exactly. <laughs> but if you did twenty minutes a day for three weeks, that's enough to at least maintain some results until you can get back to a normal schedule. So I guess you're saying kind of the same thing in your faith, like you know don't you know don't just give up because you can't you know read the Bible daily or make it to church every Sunday or whatever. Like right, get some kind of consistent try in there and interaction with God. But, um, you know, well, not- and what's crucial, like from the faith side is that if the Holy Spirit, I mean, he is our guarantee, he's our deposit. And so if he's our down payment, so to speak, he's in us. And so there's a degree which 30 seconds, you know, if I want to make a goal where I set alarm every other hour, I spend one minute and just say, thank you. Thank you for the work that I'm doing right now. I attribute every bit of success that you're building to you. Thank you. And what you're doing is you're operating from this place of continued worship. And I think what that does, because, you know, it's funny, when the Jews were moving uh, across the, the country, the worship leaders were the ones who went out in front. I mean, think about that for a second. They were blazing the trail, and so God's presence was making that way. So what happens is when you try to jump out in front of him, that's where the grinding grinds you. Mm-hmm. And at that point, you're left with nothing. There's no overflow. Yeah, and that's uh, my own tangent, but I have found myself in that place many times where it's like, well, I can't, I'm trying to do this on my own strength. And if I want to accomplish something truly big and changing, it won't be with on the legs of Greg. Yes. Like I, I need to, that's... That's and that's some pretty strong it... legs, I got to say, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, but that's like, you know, it shouldn't be, you, you don't want to shoulder it all yourself or you're going to sell yourself short. Like mm-hmm. you won't fulfill your purpose if you're trying to do it on your own strength. Absolutely. And uh, there are going to be those seasons where we get a little bit down. And sometimes you do shake things up. And, you know, for instance, like with the fast, there's so much research right now on on fasting and what it does a to the mitochondria, but the chromosomes, uh, stress causes our chromosomes to shorten. And when, when those chromosomes shorten, that, that expediates, speeds up aging. And so, you know, for some of the 20 year olds who are listening to this, are like, ah, aging, smaging, <laughs> you know, for some of the, uh, some of the, those of us that are, are kind of hitting those years in the midlife where we're kind of looking at the downside thinking, whoa, I'm about to start heading that direction. 
Um, that matters to me. And so sometimes to shake things up, if I'm going through a period where I'm grinding, grinding, and I find myself losing some time, find a day once a month where you take a two-hour break and you say, you know what, I'm reserving that time for my wife. I'm reserving that time for my kids. I'm reserving from my time wherever somebody's going to give me strength and pour into me. I'm planning, and that's the key is planning. You plan a time to get something to fill you. Mm. Ephesians 5.18 says, be not drunk on wine, but instead be filled with the Spirit. The Greek tense implies be ongoingly filled, like keep on being filled, but who's doing the action? If I told you, Greg, be filled with the Spirit, you're not filling, he is. So I'm telling you to let somebody do a thing to you. And so as we've talked about the rest and the sabbatical, well, at what point when you're grinding is something supposed to be allowed to have an impact on you? And so if it's more time with your friends, if it's more time with God, if it's more time with your wife, if it's more time just alone in the gym, Mm -hmm. you know, and no one's allowed in there and you just get to have, you know, crank up the music uh, with whatever, who's your favorite band? Oh, What's that's your too, song that that's you jam? Too hard of a question. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't. I, I just put it on Pandora, like a uh, uh, corn or something. Yeah, just let it, let it. Oh, uh, Brian Head Welch, man. Yeah. yeah, that guy. That he's got a story. Yeah, and I forget the 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 bassist. You know, he became a believer as well. Monkey, right? Was that is that who it is for corn? Right, I think. I Mac, think. If Max is watching, he'll correct me for okay. sure in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know that that uh, I love corn, and there's something about like new metal in the '90s. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, anyway, I won't pick any any bands, but that's kind of my jam when I'm working out. Too. Yeah, yeah, but that, I I do that. That's and I have to do that in someone else's gym where I can just be a member. Yes, and, and just you know not talk and hit the weights. I mean that's. That's part of my recharge. Mm-hmm. Well, Chad, man, that was great. Um, I, I always end up in each episode with um, letting you tell people how they can find you if they want to follow you online or get in touch with you or awesome. um, what you're up to. So, yeah, where can people find find Chad Hackler online? Yeah, so, uh, you know, on, on Facebook, it's just Chad Hackler, uh, H-A-C-K-L-E-R. Uh, on Instagram, my Instagram is Leadership Dude. Uh, you know, years ago when I created that website, it was kind of a merging of my training in the late eighties, nineties, where it was all about motivational speakers, Zig Ziglar. And, you know, you sales training was all this like very polished stuff. But then in the two thousands, you saw, you know, with people texting each other and emojis, it became this informal meets formal. So leadership dude mm. was kind of me gotcha. trying to merge the two and really just connect with with anybody. So leadership dude uh, on Instagram, you know, I've got a website. And I write a lot of my articles on there, but uh, typically Instagram or Facebook is where I tend to collect. And then, uh, you know, a quick plug for NPTI Dallas. For any of you guys that that even maybe you're great at fitness, maybe you've been a personal trainer for years, but what you're looking for is polish. You're looking for an influx of science. We realize on day one, we realize that people are going to be leaving us in six months. And it used to be a school with curriculum. For me, that's changed. It's now curriculum, and, and yes, that's the information, but it's the connections with everybody there where we sharpen each other, we build each other up, and if you're advanced, if you're beginning uh, your your journey in fitness, it doesn't matter. We're going to help point you to the resources so that six months after you've come into our program, you emerge a completely different kind of leader. So, yeah, Greg, just want to thank you for having me on, man. Of course, man. It was great. All right. Till the next one. Thanks, guys. <laughs>